been singing, we need to move. Yes, yes, but it, something is moving. Yes. The Holy Spirit is moving. And even among us, you know, the Holy Spirit is moving. Things are changing. Birmingham will never be the same. Things are on the move. And uh, God speaks in very different ways. And um, I was just sharing, really, how I believe that that song, Waymaker, um, is a prophetic statement for every single person here and a prophetic statement for uh, people at this time. It's a time from God. It was written by a uh, Nigerian worship leader. And every time I um, sing that song, every time I hear that song, I rejoice and I know because that word is very true. And God speaks in prophetic statements in many different ways. And um, of course this day is a significant day because of uh, you, Timothy, uh, here. And it's wonderful to have you here. But um, those of you that are on Zoom know that I have shared this uh, in the Zoom meetings. But um, two weeks ago, I was um, really burdened about people I know who are terminally ill and so much needs of healing. And um, the following day, I was walking through um, the uh, New Street station and on the th there's three plinths there with uh, metal trees there pointing in different directions. And on... Um, one of those uh, plinths at the bottom, in the middle of New Street Station feed sinks, there were these words. It says, um, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I believe that that is a prophetic statement for Birmingham, and that is a prophetic statement for all of us. And I'll just read the uh, surrounding verses. Of course, it's from Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Amen. No longer will there be any curse. Amen. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, yes. Birmingham city, and his servants will serve him, but every city Amen. in the world. Amen. Of course, this is looking forward to the heavenly city that is going to come. But this is for every city. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamb or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Mm. We're really privileged to have our freedom. And I'm going to introduce Timothy in a few moments to say we really thank you, Timothy, for being with us today and to share your heart and your story, how God delivered you from many things. And we saw a few of the news clips that we haven't heard from yourself, but I want to come and invite you. And thank you for the worship team, folks. Thank you for the worship team. God bless you. God bless you. That okay. was beautiful. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really beautiful. Yeah, worship, wasn't it? I actually almost forgot that I am speaking today. <laughs> well, I, I went to Leicester and DeMont universities, and last Friday I gave a talk there. 
Um, there was a, another speaker with me, and our main subject uh, and questions were, is there any hope? And is there any hope if someone come to knock on your door today, is there any hope for persecuted people? Or is there any hope for those who are in illness? Any hope for those in poverty? And any hope those who are struggling with lots of issues or heartbroken? Every time when I think of this, particularly last Friday, we shared lots of things. And at the end of it, three students came and said to me and to us, we decided to follow Jesus. There were hundreds of students, and three came, said, declared. And you never know, one of them could be one day become who will preach around the world, or become even a leader of some, some, uh, uh, in, in a country and to transform society and the world. And when I think of this, is there any hope for persecuted people around the world? There are 360 million at, at this moment. Then it comes to me, that picture of Jesus, who was most persecuted. And he was on the cross. What did he say that before he died on the cross? Father, they don't know who they are persecuting. And that is what happening in North Korea and other countries. They don't know those authorities who they are actually persecuting. They are God's people. Yes. 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 And that's where I was born in this country, North Korea. If I give you this picture of, brief picture of North Korea, it's a large prison society. 25 million people living in that prison. Complete information blockade both from outside and inside. And you never know, you can't watch anything from outside. It's prohibited. And in December last year, two teenagers were executed because they watched it, Squid Game. That's, that South Korean drama was on Netflix. Something that we can do and we can hope it. They can't do in North Korea. And people have to close their eyes and, and, and block their ears. Things seen, heard, have to pretend, haven't heard anything. Then can they choose what to wear? No. And we all can choose shoes uh, and trousers and pants and shirts, hairstyle even. I'm sorry that I still can't wear jeans because of that, what I have was the experience of life was there in North Korea. And people cannot even move freely. I came to Birmingham today because I had a ticket was provided from um, your kind people at um, the Living Hill Church. But I didn't need a travel document though, no passport, but in North Korea, you do need a travel document from authorities. And people do not know what a passport is or have ever imagined the foreign holidays. And that is what I call darkest and large prison country. And, and we have the youngest audience in this room, seven months. But when he starts, when she starts, turns age two nursery in North Korea, you start brainwashed. You have to bow to Kim family picture frames in every single of house hung on the wall. And that's where you have to bow to statue, like the Kim family picture frames. And outside, over 50,000 that Kim family statues. Everywhere you go in North Korea, every single of town, street, and city, there are large Kim family statues. They are God. They cannot allow any other part people can put faith, love, than Kim family. So Christians, persecutions, it is we can think and go back to early Christians. Everything has to be secret in there. North Korean authorities have been trying to wipe away every single of a Christian since when 1948. 
when that system was established and ongoing. And I have an open doors report here with me today. To 2023, 20, got 50 countries on, on here, but there are more. And that report has been putting North Korea on top of the persecution over the past 20 years. It was about the time when I escaped from North Korea. But because before then, we couldn't go back what was happening. What I'm also quite interesting, if anyone uh, and, and uh, watching this at, right now, if anyone joining from India, I can see that country India is also on top 11. The persecution there are 360 million. That is one in every seven persons simply for their faith. And this was where I was born in this country. And sadly, though, uh, uh, what my uh, life was becoming and experiencing it was quite early age when my parents first left me. I was just about nine. And one day I came home and everything was gone. Hope was upside down. So that was the first time I was experiencing at age nine. Was there any hope? I didn't even know what word of hope that time, the meaning of it. And come home, place where you had breakfast with your parents, and no one was there, frozen the feeling. First ran to your train station, train was left, came back home, withholding cloth. I was in tears all night. And that next day, I didn't know what to do. It was in the 1990s. What was happening there in North Korea? Over 3.5 million people died of starvation in North Korea. When China communist dictatorship was opening the door with the outside, because they realized they couldn't afford to feed people and uh, work with outside together, they opened the door, the economic door opened, and China doesn't have a story of starvation anymore, though persecution is still great in China. And Vietnam, also the same way they chose. That they are still communist dictatorships, but in North Korea, they closed the door. And they said, uh, if you open a window, flies come in. And the consequence of was over millions of people died of starvation. And that was the period where my parents left escape to China due to political circumstances. My didn't know what to do, but next day, that's what the life was come the reality from that moment. I was living on the street, and I've, 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 I've seen a number of kids tired of starvation every morning you wake up at the station, on the bridge, and all train containers where you sleep, that was a home. I survived. But one thing I know later, I realized, or oh, go back to the picture where I was. Did you know that God was there? But I didn't know that. And God is still there. What well, in this great persecution is going on in, this, in North Korea, who can't worship like us here so freely, who can attend church so freely, what is wrong with the, why these leaders of these countries, they persecuting their own people because they are going to attend church? Because they don't want good news. I survived on the street later on, uh, and thankfully went back to my grandmother's house, was helping uh, growing food in, 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 in mountains. So I know how to grow food in mountains. That's how you could survive. I still had last hope that could join the army in North Korea to have my own independent life. But when I went to military office, they, they said to me, you can't join the army. It's compulsory joining army in North Korea. Every man has to join the army and from 145 centimeter height and 38 kg. That's for 10 years compulsory army. And just last week we saw North Korea's military parade. And while people are dying of starving, and they put huge amount of money into that weapon investment, 
That's not primary responsibility of leadership. And they said, I can't join because your parents betrayed the country. And I realized there was nothing I could do in this country. I felt I was now abandoned, having this experience of abandonment twice. I don't use this, I don't like to use that term with my parents because something was happened, they had to choose that way. But when you're young age, come home, upside down life, it comes straight away. I have three pictures from my mother. One when she gave me birth. You know, this is the happiest moment, isn't it? I experience now because I have two children. But, and the second picture was that uh, she was waving at me on a train one of the last times. And third picture, before she passed away a few years ago, she asked me, could you please forgive me? And I have. She's now in heaven. Amen. Thank you. I didn't realize, though, when I first crossed the border to China, it was a different world. First time I was seeing the world outside. And the, the picture, I still remember it. I went to uh, I went to a Chinese market around six o'clock, getting a bit dark, and there were so many different lights and so many different clothes people were wearing. First time I saw, even first time I was seeing the young teenagers wearing the skirt and high heels, and many types of food. And that moment I was wow. This was something I, 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 what I learned in North Korea. It was total lies. Because they said that the country was the best country, the leaders were best leaders. Then they allowed their own people to die of starvation and oppressed and imprisoned, tortured and killed. And the second shocking experience I had in China was I was meeting with a missionary guy. That was a really shocking picture. I still have that feeling. And there are a lot of anti-Christian propaganda uh, dramas, textbooks, cartoons, and films in North Korea. So much they talk about how uh, Christianity is uh, uh, created by America, and so American news Christianity tried to destroy North Korea. So anyone who meets or become Christians, or meet missionaries in China, or if we sent back to North Korea, then you are being uh, 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 automatically uh, uh, treason as a spy. And what do you get when you become spy? Then you end up in a prison camp or executed publicly. This was one of the public execution I watched when I was a boy. And we were even told what's the public execution in front of the crowd, we were kids. So what we were learning in North Korea from that t uh, uh, nursery age, how to hate one another instead of love one another. So we, in uh, uh, sports activities in school, here you play cricket. How exciting, isn't it? And in North Korea, one of the sports activities is hitting American toys. And then you say, oh, we won that battle. It's how you teach it, how to hate that because they are your enemy and, and, and who try to destroy your country. That is not the right way. And that, because of that picture, when I first entered this missionary's house, I was terrified because I first time saw a cross necklace and I first saw the Bible. And in the house, there were few Kids, North Korean children were also looked after by missionaries. I thought they were kidnapped by the missionary. Something was going to happen to them. And the missionary guy was uh, bending his back, and you can see the cross necklace dangling. My eyes could not run away from me. And I thought, even you touch that, my finger could be rotten straight away. Because all that propaganda, anti-Christianity and, and anti-love education, it came to brain was it, it came to me. So I thought that that missionary was kidnapping me and selling me into trafficking, which I ran away from the house. Then later I did not realize this was a house of love 
and which I could protect it and send uh, and uh, save country without experiencing four times imprisonment later. So I made a twice escape and imprisoned four times. I was just about 17. And I, escaping from the house, continue my journey, go to Mongolian border with other 17 North Korean escapees. Some of them were Christians in that group. And I was in that time. And we were arrested at the border and sent back to North Korea. And the, one of the first questions the police asked us, has anyone in this group been to church and prayed in China? I, I was quite shocked because I did not expect in North Korea, you don't get any religious education at all. There are no Christian materials at all. If you, as soon as you are identified as someone in faith, then you are disappeared and you are executed. You are end up in prison camp. And I denied it because I ran away from missionary's house. But some, some guy next to me who confessed when question repeatedly repeated came because he was afraid and told them, well, I went to church because I needed help. And he was beaten up straight by handcuff. And then he disappeared because gone to prison camp. Now I'm in a North Korean prison cell. Small room, but 50 prisoners. We didn't have enough space. We were sitting upright each other and lean on, back, uh, on backs, each other's back. And there could be hundreds in that detention center. But just to explain it, in my prison cell, and we sit like this. Next day morning, I, I felt my back was getting so heavy. And I, 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 was, turning, I was going to tell that guy who was leaning on me against uh, could you please put your heavy weight away because it was too hard, uh, heavy for me. Then his body was falling and he died while he was leaning on against my back. And, and then I saw uh, through his shirt, the blood was streaming. He died of starvation, a lack, uh, and a lack of medical treatment and torture. When police dragged out of this guy of the cell, I, I thought I was going to be killed like him. If I was killed, I couldn't come to Birmingham today. It was praise God how he was working all the way through. I will tell you more about how then God intervening so deeply and then how the great miracle was there. And I, when I couldn't do anything in the prison cell repeatedly in the process, and, and, and they had to send me to my grandmother's house, which and they were uh, uh, waiting that I was recovered uh, from that uh, treatment in prison. And I asked my grandmother, I have to get out from this country, otherwise I will be taken away. So my grandmother thankfully helped me in three days to get me uh, across the border to China again, because that was my second escape. And that grandmother, passed away just last year. She came to South Korea as well later. Um, my second escape, I was hoping to meet with another missionary guy. But God didn't provide him with a missionary this time in case I could run away from you again. It's quite strange. Sometimes we have to know when is the moment who comes to us, where that person come from, who have sent it. And now I did not want to go to another country to, um, across the border illegally because we don't have passports because I was already traumatized. So I went to Beijing on a train. We met, uh, I met eight North Korean women refugees on a train in Beijing and we traveled to Shanghai together. because We planned to go and uh, get into American school in Shanghai. It was great risk because America is the greatest propaganda enemy to North Korea. If you arrest it and you sent back to North Korea again, you could be straight executed publicly. Tell every kid in the school, if you follow like this guy, you would be executed. And we made it successful to cross over the fen fence of American school in Shanghai. And we went, and, and, and principal came. All kids were panicking, oh, what was going on? But we had the paper. The paper written that we were we are North Korean refugees. We are seeking asylum. Please help us. 
And after half an hour, he was talking to Somir, and then he came, and the, um, the school principal came to us and said, we're sorry, we can't help you because this is not a diplomatic center. Soon after, uh, uh, dozens of police came there with uh, two vans, and which we, nine people, we made uh, human and shares. We didn't want to uh, get out of the school because it was China in the territory. And kids were surrounded, the school kids, and, and, and crying and watching us. But eventually, and Chinese police forced put us into police vans. And now we ended up in Shanghai International Prison. That was my fourth imprisonment. I lost the hope. And I didn't know what to do. So I even tried to uh, uh, kill by myself, where I swallowed uh, many medic 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 medicines and sleeping pills in the police station toilet. And then I, I, I just wanted to die by my hand rather than by the regime or by machine guns executed. And I woke up with so good feeling because the sleeping pill put me in good sleep. <laughs> um, so in, in police, uh, uh, in Shanghai, in prison cell, I was now crying every night because I knew what consequence was going to happen to me. And in my cell, there were seven uh, inmates, people from uh, Colombia, Japan, US, South Korea, Malaysia, Chinese, and I was representing North Korea. I was the youngest one. So when I was a ki uh, crying every night, this South Korean gangster, he was a gangster. He, was, uh, he had this short hair, big tattoos, muscles, you can imagine the image of a gangster. And he came to me and asked it. We speak the same language. And so I explained to him why I'm crying every night, expecting to uh, be sent back to North Korea and executed. And this strange gangster, and, and he was a few seconds in silence and then was bring a book and to show me was a Bible. That one, I ran away from it. And now in prison, of course, he couldn't run away. And he said, oh, you could read the Bible while you have some time in prison. And I thought he was definitely a crazy guy. And I am waiting for death now. And someone come to telling you, read the Bible. And then he also then said, maybe you could ask God for your survival. I, I really thought he was a strange gangster. And, but he was scary, actually. And I was thinking, OK, there's nothing what I can do in prison, the darkest, terrifying prison. Eh? Then let me ask God if God really exists there. I didn't know how to pray, though. So I asked him, how do you pray? And he said, you say amen at the end of your wishes. That's how he taught me how to pray. So the word amen, it was started from that prison cell. I, my first prayer was, God, I don't want to be killed. Amen. God, I don't want to go back to North Korea. Amen. God, I don't want to uh, go back to darkest the prison cell again. Amen. Constantly I prayed many times, many times a day. But what was happening then? When I was keep praying in this prison cell, it slowly became faith itself. And that faith was giving that hope, generating hope, and even think of, oh, maybe one day I will get out from this prison. It was very tiny and vague hope, but it was hope it came. And it gave me a feeling of that, maybe I could get out from it. And then I was more and lean on uh, someone's name called God. It was holding that rope. I didn't want to fall off. And I was praying so many times. And I first thought, if you pray that to God, God might send a helicopter like in James Bond film and destroy the prison building and get me out. About five, six weeks, I was keep praying every day so many times. No, it was not happening. And I said, no, God does not exist. So then what I did, I was going to challenge God's authorities. I said to God, God, I'm going to ask you one last time. If you're really there, you exist. You give me freedom, and in return, I will devote all my life to you. 
But if you, I was, if I would, if you, if I was sent back to North Korea and I was killed, I told him, I was going to deny his existence. And I kept with these prayers every day until the final day when two men vis visited me in the prison. And I first thought they were from North Korean embassy. So walking downstairs, I was almost dragged down all the way because I knew what was waiting for me. Then when I went outside of the prison, two men were smiling at me from far distance. i never forget that moment of picture. And, and, and they came and said, you're very, very, very lucky because China, Chinese authorities made ever and uh, maybe the first or last time the old decision, they deport me and my group to the Philippines instead of North Korea. It was, a, it was really impossible, never happened. And then what story was behind? When, I, when we were arrested uh, at the American school in Shanghai, among those students who surrounded us, one of them, 13-year-old girl, she wrote an email to journalist. So that journalist asked the journalist, and, and North Korean SKP refugees came to our school. We didn't know what to do. We were so powerless, in tears, watching. That email is still on Google, which I discovered later. And I was tearing down reading it. And that journalist then asked those major international media, BBC, Washington Post, and CNN, to press on the Chinese government to not send them back to North Korea. So when I was uh, praying, and thinking about, oh, and a helicopter would come to rescue me, but God was doing far more international campaign at that moment, and those human rights Christian groups who watched that news, they were doing protests in many countries of Chinese embassies. So when two men came and they then explained to us what was happening, what was going to do, we were given a diplomatic passport. Someone and that group, and we never knew what a passport was. We had never seen what a passport, what it could do. But we were given that diplomatic passport, what I think today was a kingdom of a passport. And we all may have deserved, it, deserved it to have that kingdom of a passport. And we were sent to the Philippines, and we were protected by Filipino police at the Manila airport, and then um, we are two more countries, but the next plane, we were even on the first class. Wow. So God had <laughs> reserved the first class even. <laughs> and it was, it was that f uh, faith in that darkest prison cell. I will never forget it, but the hope, what it generated that moment, and that hope, I am still sharing with other people and for others I'm praying, and I am also uh, continue to uh, tell the people, is there any hope? And my answer to them is yes, yes. there is hope. Yes. And today, since I arrived in the UK, and in 2008, and um, I, I, I came here without any spoken English, but there was an opportunity in this country, pen and paper I was able to have. I'm still carrying my pen here and papers. And I was able to go to school and uh, uh, learn GCSE, college, universities. I studied two political degrees. And, and after that, I, had, I was given an opportunity to work in our parliament. I, I call now our parliament because I also have a citizenship of this country. And, and, and continue on that now I am speaking on behalf of persecuted people in North Korea and other countries. But the transformation, one thing I can also share with you is that it was not the end, that journey, when I arrived here. But the struggling part, it was coming with that trauma. I didn't realize what trauma I have had gained from the past life. Sometimes I woke up at midnight, I didn't realize I was where I was, in Chinese prison cell, North Korea, escaping on the plane. I had to go outside, and, and when I finally saw English tree sign, I was able to go back to Sweden. But during all that trauma struggle, and Jesus was keep reminding me how to get to close to God, 
and the practical life of how equipping love, and particularly the how you forgive another. Because my trauma was also linked to that I was holding hatred in my heart a lot. First, who? My parents. And, and Jesus was uh, practicing me that love, how it can transform. And I was able to declare to forgive my parents first. And then he also been then teaching me. And uh, even the great readers role in this well, how he washed his feet and servant feet. That picture of this, how to serve one another. And that picture has been great and learning and process of it, um, uh, keeping the love of Jesus, how we approach with the fragrance. And the, another point, he's also teaching me this. That is without sin among you. Let him first cast a stone at her. John 8, 7. What does that mean? Anyone in this room or myself, anyone, who we think we are the right person to throw that, cast stone at that person, can't do that. Do not discriminate. Whether that person or, uh, from different country, different ethic, or, uh, or a different nationality. Because after all, we're all in God's children. And that teaches me how to maintain humility and humbleness and generosity and speak uh, for those who can speak for themselves. And the great journey it has been, particularly that transformation of how to forgive one another. And this is one great part we are all struggle actually. Because of that, we can't forgive one another or are keeping our hatred. That's how we are seeing today conflict, wars, and refugees. How many refugees we have around the world? 81 million. And 360 million persecution. That is because of, the, uh, of this anger, hatred, yes. and it's constant repeat. This is what Jesus has come to. Even before he died on the cross, he said. But there is a great metaphor as well. How we approach and pray for one another and, and, and love one another. And today, if you came to ask me years ago, pray for your own leader in North Korea, I probably said, no, I'm not going to pray for them. But today, I pray for my uh, uh, North Korean leaders. Because God's work yeah. is a miracle. Sometimes you never know what to penetrate into yeah. their heart. Because in his creation, we have seen many miracle parts of. Even we could go back to the Second World War in the UK. The rescuing over 300,000 French and, and, and British troops. If Hitler didn't make, give um, German soldiers 24 hours break, it was wiped away. The war could not ended what we saw, the victory was there. But when everyone, when King George, was it five, six, when called the nation to pray, everyone went into the building and prayed. What was happening that time? All of a sudden, hundreds of fishing boats came and rescued every single of the French and British troops because that was a good fight. We do have to remember there is a good fight as well. When God, when God, this was someone, one of our brothers said, when God creates history, he does it through the lives of individuals. And this is all of us, how we continue to carry on the, his creation and kingdom. And we need far more love than hate one another. And if we do that, and that I do because of my children now, and for younger generations, and because of that, there is a hope. And that has transformed our world for many years. Jesus came over 2,000 years ago. But his the faith, love, and hope, that is still here. And that legacy is there tomorrow, as we can see this. The same yesterday and today and forever. I will finish with this.
someone's poem. I really like it. Someone's called Kamand Kojuri. I think he's someone Iranian. Also, the persecution is greatly happening in Iran. She says this, the silence of the hidden and forgotten, the silence of abused and tortured, the silence of the persecuted and imprisoned, the silence of the hanged and massacred. Loud as all the sounds can be, let my silence be loud, so the hungry may eat my word, and poor may wear my word. Loud as all the sounds can be, let my silence be loud, so I may resurrect the dead and give voice to the oppressed. God bless you all. Thank you. We want to pray for North Korea. This, you're a walking miracle, yeah. and we thank you for sharing today. So let's pray for Timothy, for his future. You're working with open doors. You're ministering in the governments. So Father God, we ask you to bless Timothy yes. and further advance his ministry yes. and his cause. We say it's our cause too. Yes. It's a body of Christ cause. We know our brothers and sisters go through it. And Jesus said, when you pray for those in prison, that we pray as though we're with them. Yeah. Yeah. And I relate to you. I can relate to you. So Father God, I thank you for Timothy, yeah. that you really bless him. Yeah. Lord God, and, and we just pray for the change of North Korea. We pray for the government to be brought to its knees in the right way of saying that, to know Jesus as Lord, the only one that's bowed down to is Jesus. Yeah. So Father God, we pray just like Daniel was in those circumstances, but Father God, we pray for North Korea right now, that you release many more prisoners and, and bring the regime to an end. Father God, you can do anything, as, as Timothy said, our prayers, they, they are impacting. And so we have an impact because God answers the prayers. So Father, that's what we ask, that you do a work in North Korea that, that we've never seen yet. And bless Timothy for coming and sharing and bless his family. Bless his little ones, Father God, and encourage him in Jesus' name. Thank you, Timothy. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. It's very rare we get somebody like Timothy to come, and I was so pleased that Jess could connect us with Timothy. I'm so glad that you could come and hear for yourselves. I've got a saviour. He lives right inside of me. Whoa, yeah. His name is Jesus, he means so much to me. Oh, yeah. He went to the cross to pay for our sins. 